like dad and start yelling your name out and squeezing? Be like dad and start yelling your name out and squeezing? Can you do that to me? Good morning. All right, we'll get started here this morning. Marlene, you got a verse today? Romans 6, 14. For sin shall no longer be your master, because you are not under the law, but under grace.
Oh boy, he's good. He's above all things. Outstretched on His love endures forever For the life It's been reborn His love endures forever Sing praise Sing praise Sing praise Sing First Baptist Voca. We're going to read God's Word together in just a moment here, so I invite you to turn to Psalm 136. Just as a little advance uh, notice, I'm going to ask for you to audibly participate in the reading of Scripture together this morning. Now, we have a video here that uh, we would like to take uh, time to show you. Hey guys, we just wanted to make a, a quick video to thank you for financially supporting us. Um, you guys are all part of our team. Sacrificially to make this work in, in Indonesia possible. Uh, we're, we're getting excited to be able to go over there. Um, coming in March, that's our goal. Um, and we right now are, are at 48% of our support, and that is because of you guys. And we just wanted to make a video and thank you guys because we know that you guys are making a sacrifice in giving to us and giving to this work in Indonesia and coming along with us in that and that money doesn't grow on trees, and that you guys have jobs, and you guys work hard every day and to survive, and not only that, but that you guys give a portion of that to this work in Indonesia. And we just want to say that we recognize that, and we, we are so grateful and humbled that you guys would be a part of this. Okay. Yeah, we are getting extra excited um, here as this month we have started gathering some of the things where the paperwork and and various things we're going to need when we apply for visas um, once we reach the 75% support mark. So we've um, applied for this guy's passport. Yeah, a cute photo. He did take a good photo. 
and uh, that was fun. And so that's just made us extra excited as we are drawing very close to our time to go overseas and um, are just so thankful for your guys' um, prayer support and your financial commitment and just wanted to make this video to express how thankful we are for you. And out. <laughs> A good image to end with there. We're going to uh, take time to continue to give thanks uh, together. And though we don't normally read responsib res responsibly, I don't, that may be true, responsibly, I'm going to ask uh, for us to read responsibly uh, this morning. And I want to just give a quick word of explanation why I think this is helpful, even though we don't do it much. The Word of God should shape our minds the way that we think and the way that we feel. Most things don't shape us very deeply that we only hear or learn once. Like I know some of us pick up things more quickly than, than others, but none of us who have learned something just one time have learned it as well as somebody who's learned it over and over again. It's just true. Uh, it takes time, particularly, to learn or to know and to feel what is true and what is right. We just don't seem to pick it up very quickly. However, that one of the risks of repeating things over and over again is one of two things will happen. When we repeat things a lot, we will become either hardened to it where we become softened to it. And it's the same with God's word. Uh, it really is an amazing thing. When we, re we, we, we do things over and over again, and this is something that God has done with days and weeks and years and even his redemption. God is working redemption in your life, and he's working it in my life. He's worked it in the lives of people who've come before us. And in this psalm, when we read about Israel, it's not just a historical lesson, it's a reminder of how God has worked his redemption even in his, peop in his people uh, before, that came before us, the people of Israel. So as we read, um, I'll read the uh, first line, your part, uh, there's different uh, translations, but we'll go, his love endures forever. Um, and I will combine some of the lines just uh, in acknowledgement that we're not used to this type of, of thing. But I encourage us as we read together to read responsibly and reflectively uh, rather than just rotely uh, God's word. Verse 1, give thanks to the Lord for he is good. His love endures forever. Give thanks to the God of gods. Give thanks to the Lord of lords. His love endures forever. To him alone who does great wonders, his love endures forever. Who by his understanding made the heavens, his love endures forever. Who spread out the earth upon the waters, his love endures forever. Who made the great lights, the sun to govern the day, his love the moon and stars to govern the night. His love endures forever. To him who struck down the firstborn of Egypt and brought Israel out from among them. His love endures forever. With a mighty hand and an outstretched arm. His love endures forever. To him who divided the Red Sea asunder and brought Israel through the midst of it but swept Pharaoh and his army into the Red Sea. To him who led his people through the desert, his love endures forever. Who struck down great kings and killed mighty kings, his love endures forever. Sion, king of Amorites, and Og, king of Bashan, his love endures forever. And gave their land as an inheritance. His love and endures forever, an inheritance to his servant Israel. His love endures forever. To the one who remembered us 
in our low estate, his love endures forever. And freed us from our enemies, his love endures forever. And who gives food to every creature, his love endures forever. Give thanks to the God of heaven, his love endures forever. Let's give thanks to him right now. O oh God, we give thanks to you, something you have called for all people everywhere and all time to do. And we have abundant reason to do so. You are good. You are beautiful. You are kind and gracious. You are righteous and holy. You are all, all powerful and all knowing. Your wisdom, your understanding, your discernment, the depths of of who you are and what you do have no end. And your love does endure forever. And Lord, we confess that we are slow to learn these things and that we often learn them very superficially. And so we, this morning, are again coming before you as we did last week and by your will, we will do next week, should Christ not return, and the week after that, and the week after that. To remind ourselves, to be reminded of your word, for your word to settle more deeply in our thinking and in our feeling. For us to see new things that you are doing around us in one another's lives and in our lives that you would continue to teach us and instruct us. Lord, we ask that you would continue to draw our hearts to gratitude and to be thankful to you for what you have done, for all of the little details, Lord, that we tend to overlook. We take for granted that you will provide food for us today and tomorrow and this week. And so we want to take time to thank you. We take for granted that the sun will rise tomorrow. We will be warmed by it that the rain will water the land uh, that sustains us. We want to thank you for it. It's easy, Lord, even for us to take for granted that you sent your son Jesus to die for us so that we can be in your presence and know your loyal, faithful, steadfast, never-ending love forever. And we want to thank you for that. You have been good and kind and true to us every day of our lives. And so we thank you, and we want to praise you here this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. You called me from the grave by name. You called me out of all my shame. I see the old has passed away. The new has come. Now I have resurrection power. Living on the inside, Jesus, you have given us
the beginning one with God the Lord most high your hidden glory in creation now revealed in you are Christ what a beautiful name it is what a beautiful name it is the name of Jesus Christ my King what a beautiful name it is nothing compares to this what a beautiful name it is the name of Jesus did in one heaven without us so Jesus you brought heaven down my sin great your love was greater what could separate us now what a wonderful name it is what a wonderful name it is the name of jesus christ my king what a wonderful name it is nothing compares to this what a wonderful name it is
Heavenly Father, we give you praise for this morning, for the opportunity to come together, Lord, to <clears throat> worship you, to sing praises, Lord, to learn from your word, and to fellowship one with another, Lord, as you help us to be a great day that we would be able to come out from here ready to serve you even better than before. We'll dismiss kids up through third grade whose parents would like them to go to junior church this time. And they're off. So my question, whoops, my question to most of you would be, Art, hang on. My question to you would be, were you as excited to come to church Isaac, pull me back just a little bit in the, pull that slider down. Were you as excited to come to church as those guys were to go to junior church? Because <laughs> you ought to have been. You really ought to have been. Um, this morning we'll uh, start the last chapter of 2 Timothy. Um, and as Paul uh, takes a look. Um, there are many things for him to be thankful for. I hope that you have spent some time this month thinking about being thankful and great things to be thankful for. I was looking for um, a little bit different, unusual things to be thankful for. And uh, it wasn't at first what I thought it was. Thankful for toilet paper, which serves as a great bookmark when, I'm lo when I've lost all my other ones. Doubles as a tissue when needed during a, the story. Um, there are other reasons to be thankful. Thankful for dirty dishes. And I thought, yeah, because we have food to put on them, right? Because there's a lot of people who don't have dirty dishes because they just don't have any reason to make the dishes dirty. Um, for chaos. <laughs> Because it helps us to rem and turmoil. Because it helps us to remember what things are important. Uh, I need that reminder. I, I need to be thankful. I'm thankful for being busy, but thankful that there is a purpose and that we need to get to that purpose. Let's take some moments and pray and ask God to give us wisdom as we look at His Word. Uh, Father God, we are uh, about to dig into the truth of God's word, the truth of your word, the very word that is spoken to us, our daily bread, that which sustains us, helps us to grow. Father, we pray that as we hear, we would, we would be challenged, and that, Lord, we would be encouraged, uh, that we would follow after you, and we would give you the praise and the honor and the glory. For it is in Christ's name that we pray. Amen. 2 Timothy 3 was the reminder that the times we're in are perilous, that the people that are around us are not all that great, but that we will suffer persecution. Uh, we'll be outnumbered. Uh, it comes up again and again. Right? He, he talks about the, the number of evil men and who's standing against them. Timothy. All right? Um, but needs to continue to go on. He equips, he gives us the, the thing that we need, his word, right? This is the very word of God and that has been entrusted to us, uh, blessed us with, and, and how will we live with that? And it's not enough as we come to 2 Timothy 4, it's not enough to just have it, to even just read it, to just know it. Uh, he, he comes to 2 Timothy 4, and he, he tells Timothy, I charge you, therefore, before God and the Lord Jesus Christ, who will judge the living and the dead at his appearing and his kingdom. All right? There is a sense in which this is definitely directed towards those who preach, okay? And, and I understand that. But there is definitely a sense in which it is directed to each and every one of us. Because all of us, everyone, will stand in judgment before God. Um, 
Timothy because of the judgment that's coming. And then he, he goes into that. But let me just take a step back and, and think through with you really quickly the, the different judgments that are, that are mentioned in, in Scripture Okay, we'll, we'll come back to that, the Bema seat, the judgment, as that's the one that Paul's referring to. But he, he's going to the judge, Daniel 12, 1, uh, regathered Israel. Um, <laughs> it'll be the punishment of the Jews for their disobedience to God, their rejection of Jesus Christ. Um, during the tribulation and after the close of the present age of grace, Israel will pay for her sins, being afflicted with unprecedented misery and woe. There's the judgment of the living nations. At the end of the tribulation period, after Israel's been judged, the nations of the earth will be judged by Christ, uh, not against individuals, but against nations for their treatment of the Jewish people. Uh, you find that in Joel chapter 3. The judgment of the fallen angels, the final judgment against Satan and other fallen angels, uh, judged with them immediately after the 1,000 years of the kingdom age. Satan and his hosts meet their doom. Uh, we find that in Jude chapter 6. The judgment of the unbelieving dead, called the great white throne judgment. After the casting of Satan into hell, the wicked dead will be raised to receive the final sentence of condemnation, Revelation chapter 20. The good news is that if we have come before God and we have understood that we are sinners and we have trusted Christ as our Savior, then we do not face condemnation. We will face judgment. God will judge us, the Bema Seat of Christ, Christ will judge us um, for our responsibility, uh, for our duty, for our reaction, for our living, uh, for him. Uh, we find it in 1 Corinthians 3, 1 Corinthians 5. Um, let me just read part of 1 Corinthians chapter 3. We are laborers together with God. You are God's husbandry. You are God's building. According to the grace of God, which is given unto me as a wise master builder, I've laid the foundation, another builds on, but let every man take heed how he builds. For other foundation can no man lay than that which is laid, which is Christ Jesus. If any man build upon this foundation gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, stubble, there's quite a variation of things that you can build, Every man's work will be made manifest, for the day will declare it. It will be revealed by fire. The fire shall try every man's work of what sort it is. If any man's work abide, which he hath built thereupon, he shall receive a reward. If any man's work be burned, he'll suffer loss, but he himself shall be saved, yet so as by fire. And as Paul is coming to the, to the end of his life, this passage is going to talk about his departure, his being poured out. Um, he's looking and he's saying, hey, Timothy, I'm, I'm really close to finishing up what I can do. And what I want you to understand, Timothy, is you need to think about the end even now. How will you finish? Because you will be judged for that. Believers are rewarded based on how faithfully they've served Christ. 1 Corinthians 9, 2 Timothy 2. Uh, some of the things that we might be judged on are how well we obeyed the Great Commission. How victorious we were over sin. How well we controlled our tongues. The Bible speaks of receiving crowns and we'll finish this passage with that as well. James 1.12 is a good summary. Blessed is the man who pres who perseveres under trial, because when he has stood the test, he will receive the crown of life that God has promised to those who love him. We're called upon to be steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that our labor is not in vain in the Lord. God will judge and God will reward. Whatever you do, do it heartily as to the Lord, not unto men, knowing that of the Lord you will receive the reward of the inheritance, for you serve the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, little children, abide in him that when he shall appear, we may have confidence and not be ashamed before him at his coming. Right? Realize that what we're doing here and now, God is watching. Realize that what we do this afternoon, 
what we do tomorrow, what we do throughout this week, Christ is watching. He will judge. He will reward. Right? And, and, and Paul says, Timothy, look, it's important that you, you treasure God's word and that you hide it in your heart. But Timothy, that's not the end of it. God wants to know that you're proclaiming it. He wants to see us proclaim it, not just in word, but definitely by word. Preach the word. Be ready in season, out of season, convince, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and teaching. Right? We mentioned it already, but Jesus reminds us in Matthew 12, everyone will have to give an account on the day of judgment for every empty word that they've spoken. It kind of makes me think it's probably for every full word that we've spoken as well, right? Every complete word, every good word that we've spoken. And this definitely should be a part of what we're, we're thinking through is how do we proclaim this truth that we say we hold important, valuable, life-giving? We have the opportunity to proclaim the word of life. When it's popular and when it's not. In season and out of season. So, how do we do? How, how are we doing? Are, are we proclaiming that same-sex marriage is wrong? But, here's the thing I want you to think through each one of these. Because it's easy for us to proclaim what's negative and not back it up with what is true and positive and right right are are we just denouncing or are we faithfully living out our a loving marriage and living it out and saying wow it it's right faithful loving marriage is right even when it's hard even when yeah i like that especially when it's hard Right, because that, that makes this live. Right, because I can't get along with my spouse. My spouse can't get along with me. And we decide, well, we just weren't made for each other. And look, sitting here in the sanctuary, it's really easy for us to look and say, well, obviously you weren't made for anybody, right? Right? Because that's, that's what we know is objective truth, right? You can't always get along with anybody. Everybody. Some one of, the, one of those words. You, you, you can't do it. Some, yeah, some of you can't do it with anybody, but some, most of us can't do it with everybody, okay? What, what do we need? Well, we need the grace of God to get us through. And yes, that does mean waking up some mornings and saying, I choose to do what God says and so I will love you even though I can't at the moment figure out how I can do that. Right? It is not popular right now to say that there are only two genders. Right? And so we could, we could proclaim it, and we should proclaim it. But we also need to proclaim that men need to live as men, and women need to live as women. We need to fulfill the biblical roles that God has given so that we're, we're demonstrating the truth, not just saying, oh, you're wrong. They are wrong, but show them what's right. It is very unpopular right now to say homosexuality is wrong. Right? We see it pervading more and more. Every television show that you watch, everything that goes on is all over the place. And it is is being pushed. And we should proclaim, this is wrong. Why? Because God's word says it's wrong. 
in spite of the number of churches that say, well, God has nothing to say about it. <laughs> no, <laughs> read the word. It's pretty clear. It's not pretty clear. It's absolutely clear. Right? So we need to proclaim that. And, and that means I need to proclaim it here, and we all need to proclaim it out in our world. But again, not just that that's wrong. Let's, let's have Christians demonstrate what true love is. Right? Because that, that's, that's not right to just denounce what's wrong and not to live what's right. right? It's popular in our culture to say that the Bible is not relevant for our time. But we need to proclaim that the Bible is relevant and we need to proclaim it in such a way that we are as excited to read God's word as those kids were to get out. Hopefully they were excited to get to junior church, not just get out, all right? But we, we, we need to demonstrate that this, this is great. This is, there is, there is relevancy, there is, there is rightness here. That the reason why God inspired all scripture was because we could live it out. It's popular in our culture to say there are not, that there are many ways of salvation. It is not popular, but we need to proclaim there is but one way of salvation. Mormonism is wrong. Catholicism is wrong. The health wealth gospel is wrong. Being a good person is wrong. That is not true. That is not what the inspired word of God says is the one and only way to salvation. And we need to proclaim that. And that's not popular. It's out of season. But also what we need to do is we need to proclaim what's right. That man is lost, but... Man is deceived into false religion, but God has given clearly his way of salvation. That Jesus Christ died in our place for our sin so that we could be free. You sang it. Do you believe it? Convince rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and teaching. It, 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 it jumps back to why God gave us the word and what the word was for, right? And, and it just reiterates it. Okay, so, so know it, read it, have it do that to you. And then Timothy and everyone else, you're supposed to proclaim it. You're supposed to preach the word. Be ready in season, out of season. Figure it. Notice where it's telling us. We're wrong, tell us where we're right, uh, encourage, and do it with 80% long-suffering and teaching. <laughs> so that's not what it said, no. With all long-suffering, with all patience, right? And I, I, I understand that's, that's difficult. Coworkers, neighbors can be really hard convince but with all long suffering and teaching living it out that's what we're called to do why because the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine but according to their uh, own desires because they have itching ears they will heap up for themselves teachers and they will turn their ears away from their, the truth and be turned aside to fables and I came across this really interesting um, thought on that 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 just struck a chord. Suppose that I told you that I was a great dancer. <laughs> that, that's the response I was waiting for. <laughs> uh, my wife knows I'm not a great dancer. Um, your wife tells you you're lousy. Your friends cringe. But do you stop? No, you, you think of most movie plots today. How, how would this scenario end? Well, I, I'd hire a professional. I, I'd surround myself with people who say, follow your heart, pursue your dream, work your tail off, overcome. 
Okay. And I don't want to take away from the fact that I do think people can change and that, you know, there are things that we need to change and we need to, to pursue and diligently. But when it comes to the truth of the word of God, going to find somebody who agrees with you when you don't agree with God is a bad idea. All right. And that's exactly what they'll do. And I, I, I could not remember the name of the book that I listened to uh, probably almost a year ago, but it was on confirmation bias, which basically says you find, you seek after facts that will back up what you already believe. Okay? And that's what we find. Most of your Facebook friends eagerly support you because they all believe the same thing you do. And whether or not they actually have factual facts or just that they found the fact and then you buy into that and that's what you remember. And we're, we're very susceptible to that. We have to be very careful. Um, but that's exactly what the world will do. I, I'll find a pastor who will who will marry me and my, my same-sex partner. I'll find a pastor who will, right? Does that make it right? No. What that is is that they're, they're not enduring sound doctrine and they're, they're, they're finding those who will, will back up what they believe. <laughs> One of the biggest... We're going. Verse 5. But you be watchful in all things. Endure afflictions. Do the work of an evangelist. Fulfill your ministry. All right. Paul's coming to the end. And he knows it's the end. And and he wants Timothy, who's a young pastor, to to catch the vision, to keep his eyes on Jesus, to follow after Jesus. There's a lot stacked against him, right? There's all these false teachers. He's named some of them by name. And, and he says it's hard and you will suffer persecution. But, but it will be worth it. Be watchful. Endure. Do the work of an evangelist. Um, fulfill your ministry. I don't know if you noticed it, but uh, several of the other slides, I, I put quotes from William Carey. Um, Partly because as I was studying, I got slightly off on a tangent, not real far. But I, and uh, one of the thoughts that, that came up that took me off on a, a little bit of a course is, as we think about the lost, and I, I know I'm guilty, I, I, I can hear myself saying it. Uh, they're lost and they're going to hell. And that's true. But is that the reason that we should be going out to win the lost, to, to fulfill the work of evangelists? And yes, and no. Because what, is that, what does that make it all about? It makes it all about people. And that really isn't the whole point of Scripture. Scripture. The reason why we come to Christ is for God's glory. And the the reason William Carey wanted to go to India, a shoemaker who who gave up everything and lost much, was, was not because the lost were going to hell, but because the glory of God would not be... Resounded from that nation if someone didn't go. Do you, do you see? Not to take away from the fact that the lost are dying and going to hell, but the fact that we look at it and we think through it differently that they're not only lost, but they are not giving God the glory that He deserves. And it really and truthfully is about God. It, it really isn't about us Amen. or them. We, we come together here and we, we worship. What does that mean for you? Does that mean that, you know, they sing a couple of peppy songs and you're like, 
wow, I'm just so psyched up, I can go out here and I can, I can conquer the world. Well, not that that's necessarily a horrible thing. But worship really isn't about us. We're supposed to come together to worship God. Even as we're, we're studying his word, the, the, real, the real point is not, well, what am I doing wrong? What am I doing right? How can, you know, how can I do better this week? It is, but the, the overall point is, how can I glorify God more? Because he is worthy of all worship, all glory. Timothy, keep your eyes on the real thing. Be watchful in all things, endure afflictions, do the work of an evangelist, fulfill your ministry. Yes. But don't forget. The whole point of this is, is that, that you would glorify your Father in heaven. Why? Because life is not long. For I am already being poured out as a drink offering, and the time of my departure is at hand. Um, Paul takes a, a quick look at himself and says, look, I, we're all, I'm almost done. And you, you, do, you, know, you, you do need to, to think through with Paul this death idea, right? He... he He's being poured out as a drink offering. His, his final sacrifice, the, the last ounce of, of him, is being poured out as a, a thanksgiving, a, 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 a libation to God. And the time of my departure is at hand. And he, he, he's not looking at it as um, an ending. You, you depart, you leave from one place to go to another. Right. And, and he, he's not thinking, that, wow, it's all over. No, I, I'm finally going where I need to go. He uses the, the word um, analusis, uh, uh, loosing, uh, my departure, the time of my departure. Here's a couple of other ways that, that it's used, but it gives us more of, a, of an idea of... <laughs> how we should think through death. Unyoking an animal from the shafts of the plow, right? Our work is done. Okay, we get to, to leave that burden. Uh, loosening of chains, fetters, or bonds that held a prisoner, right? We are, we are not prisoners of sin, right? We've been set free, but yet there is much that, that shackles us, and yet what death does for the believer not for the unbeliever, but for the believer, is looses them from that. Packing up a tent. Right? Paul had used the whole idea of a tent, earthly tents. Um, in other scripture, and, and this word has that idea of just packing it up and, and, and going. Loosing the mooring ropes of a ship, and heading off. John MacArthur said, for the Christian, death is laying down all your burden, all your toil, all your labor in order to rest forever. Death is laying aside all that binds and holds of sin and difficulty. Death is striking camp, as it were, to take up residence in a permanent place in an eternal home. And death is casting off the ropes which bind us to this world to sail into God's world where we will live in his presence forever. As I was looking for strange things to be thankful for, I came across um, this from Linda Thompson. And it, to me, it, it harkens back to this correct view of death. Uh, she had spent some time uh, researching the story of the Plymouth Colony. And uh, her question was, what kind of faith bears believers across oceans and sustains them through the valley of the shadow of death? How could people who gave up everything to obey God's word as they understood it, only to face weeks of illness, 
loss of wives, husbands, children, not start to question at least a little. God, are you really in this thing? Heavenly Father, are you there? She said, I'm sure I would, but the pilgrim's accounts give no hint of this. Instead, they accept God's sovereign will when they experience it as adversity. Thank him when they experience it as blessing and approach him with an attitude of trust at all times. For example, listen to what Bradford wrote about the first winter here in America. But it pleased God to visit us then with death daily. And with a disease so disastrous that the living were scarcely able to bury the dead. And the healthy not in any measure to tend the sick. But Bradford also testified. They had borne their sad afflictions with as much patience and contentedness as I think any people could do. But it was the Lord who upheld them and had beforehand prepared them. (laughs) That's trusting God. That's then being thankful for whatever he brings. And I trust that you'll spend some time being thankful. Uh, We're gathering together Wednesday night uh, to share with one another the things that God has done (laughs) that cause us to rejoice, to cause us to thank him. I hope that you'll join us. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you so much for the opportunity we have uh, to study your word for the encouragement that it gives us that, Lord, there is before us uh, reward as well as judgment. Help us to live faithfully. Help us to live for your honor, for your glory. We pray in Christ's name. Amen. A couple of things just to bring to your attention. We'll uh, have Sunday school here in just a few moments. Uh, Tonight we're back Studying Isaiah here in the sanctuary, the youth group's meeting, MAPS kids are, are gathering together, writing thankful cards, and again, I would encourage you to come Wednesday night, uh, 6.30, uh, also in the bulletin along with a lot of other things are opportunities for you to serve, and, uh, and there are a lot of sign-up sheets for the nativity that are out there, please make sure that you take notice of them. Thank you for coming, we are dismissed. <laughs>